So this is a three frequency um, geodesic dog. Pressure treated uh, base, two foot tall, knee walls. Uh, top should be about 22 feet high, that's scaffolding 16 feet. Use strips of garage sale metal to do the sides so they're flexible and they can move it around a little bit. One thing that I've noticed in the build of the uh, three frequency, 300 square foot over there versus uh, this one is I really like being able to move the foundation around. Um, it helps get uh, things a little easier together. The other thing that's important is doing it like this, one course at a time, instead of going around the base and doing it vertically, doing it kind of at this 45 degree angle, makes it it's so much easier putting it together. It's the smart way to go. Okay, a couple things, this entrance was kind of a challenge to frame up. I'm still not done with that, obviously. Um, what really cost me a lot of time was the metal, putting this um, reinforcing metal into place. I didn't realize how long it would take me. I've been working for two days on that, <sighs> cutting everything and putting it in. I have at least another day before I'm done. So that's kind of a challenge. Well, I'm in process of putting up some polycarbonate panels. Um, I painted the whole thing with an oil-based paint. It's a mixture of oil, um, lacquer, stain, uh, and enamel and alkyde, all mixed with gasoline as a cheap paint thinner. And I got it all really cheap at, at Sherwin-Williams as Oops Paint. A lot of it I got for free. Um, I guess average about two dollars a gallon. But I went through probably, I'm thinking maybe 35 gallons to paint it so put a couple coats on okay so I did the vestibule and got that skinned up last week and uh, worked on the top and on that one side yesterday in the snow it was snowing and pretty cold I wanted to point out something one thing that's recommended is to keep that skin on but the fierce wind you you peel a little off and it ended up stripping it one thing I wanted to point out too was this H channel. What I do is just pound it in from the top and that kind of fills in that gap. Seems to do okay. It's a real pain, but it's a lot easier than the alternative of trying to stick them in. Coal stacks are very inexpensive. In this case, these two by threes that you see doubled up here, those two by threes are ripped down from 16 foot long two by sixes that I picked up for about a dollar each. So each individual stud, eight foot stud, ran me about 25 cents. The reinforcing metal you see that is also painted, that came from a DOE auction lot and I paid about four cents a linear foot for it, including the screws you see that attach it. The insulation is premium polyisocyanurate. It's the best insulation you can get. Typically it's on the order of about 80 cents a board foot. I purchased that for 7 cents a board foot by using factory seconds. The aluminum foil is heavy duty commercial grade. I picked it up for about $25 from Sam's Club. And I glued it on with what's called fiber reinforced Glue that cost about $60 from Home Depot. I have a primary and a secondary water recycling system. And you see all the water I spilt on the ground. I just watered it. Water is pretty quick. I depended on flood irrigation. Flood irrigation allows uh, minimal pressure and high flow to flood an area. Now there's benefits to that because there's very little power consumption. There's a lot of power consumption when you pressurize water to a high enough pressure you can spray. And by avoiding that, you can save a lot of energy costs, which means you can use off-grid solar panel. Underneath the gravel, about a foot under, I have silage tarps. Silage tarps are those large white polyethylene plastic sheeting used to hold corn silage that are fed to dairy cows. 
Silage tarps are discarded when they're finished. They're usually hauled to the landfill. Frequently, they're just burned by local farmers. So it's a win-win for you to go in and pick them up. They are free. So I have about three layers underneath this, and the ground tapers to the middle, where I built a cistern. So those silage tarps bring the water to this grow bed, underneath this grow bed, about 18 inches. And then they seep through holes that I placed at strategic locations. Now you see a pipe there running water. That pipe is a secondary, actually a primary water uh, capture system. That four inch sewer line runs underneath the gravel, but on top of the silage tarps and circumscribes all of the grow beds. So it's underneath the grow beds, each one. And I have holes drilled at the top of that sewer line and then recycled free carpet on top of the 79 cent per foot four inch sewer line that I purchased from Lowe's. The carpet acts as a filter which keeps the sewer line from getting clogged up and allows all this water and the cistern will act as a heat sink in the summer and heat source in the winter. The grow beds were made fairly inexpensively using a 10 to 1 ratio of earth to Portland cement. And then stucco was made in a similar ratio with gravelous earth to Portland cement and was spread over portions of the grow beds as well as the cinder blocks, which once again I received for free. The 21 foot high ceiling allows me to rely on the stack effect where hot air is buoyant and is lighter or less dense than the cooler air and it can flow out through the top. The vent at the top is run by two cylinders filled with beeswax that automatically react to the temperature changes to cause the hatch to open. So no electricity is necessary to cool this structure. No forced ventilation, just strictly relying on the stack effect. So the temperature doesn't exceed about 110 degrees even in the highest temperatures in the summer. The biggest stride that I can recommend here is glazing. Multi-layer polycarbon is the most resilient and um, thermally effective glazing. It diffuses the light so you can grow even in shadowed locations. Those areas over there have received no sunlight for the last month or so. But still, .com, and to create a cooperative of like-minded people and import a cargo container, an entire cargo container. This is our lime tree that's blossoming. We have little baby blossoms on it. And our parsley's blossoming nicely. And we have little baby cabbages. Yay! They're starting to curl up over there. We have lots and lots and lots of broccoli and spinach and peas and celery all over the place. This is a permaculture approach, so there's no till. That's why we didn't pull the beans. It'll reseed itself for the spring. Now this is a, an approach to no-till. It's the beginning of February. I want to plant peppers and uh, tomatoes. So I'm just going to let the goats and chickens stay in here for a few couple weeks. And they'll eat everything down. Um, you know, I fed them all the tomatoes and peppers already. Pulled those out in December. So th these are all new growth items. We had corn here originally and that we planted in July and got rid of that in November. We planted in November and December a variety of things. So we want to be able to get an early start in the spring. We have starts of peppers and tomatoes that are waiting to be planted. This approach is going to minimize uh, any dependency on fossil fuels. And to add a benefit, we're going to be able to, uh, you know, fertilize for free. So hopefully it'll work out well. That's the game plan here. One thing I noticed 
um, is just the wood I used. I, I regret not using pressure treated wood or rot resistant wood. I haven't seen any indications of rot, but I confident that over time that the paint's just going to give out. Uh, it's not going to hold up as well as I hoped in this very humid environment. On a go-forward basis, the greenhouses that I'm building are all going to be using galvanized steel. Uh, there's just no reason to go to the effort and expense, particularly in terms of polycarbonate panels, for something that is only going to last you know, 10 years. And I fear this wood here is going to last even less than that uh, if I don't, you know, uh, go through and, and repaint it now and then. And that's a lot of labor. It's definitely not something you want to deal with. So something to keep in mind, I think if you use some pressure treated wood and put a nice coat of paint, you're going to seal the chemicals in. Don't have to worry about that. Hey, one thing I wanted to point out, these are what the silage tarps look like. Uh, white on one side, black on the other. Uh, I did get a pile of these from the agricultural co-op as well as a dairy friend that I have. So you can use these. They're free. Great opportunity to minimize waste in landfills and also, um, you know. Have free plastic. Yeah, this these are grow beds. So on the exterior of this dome, we went ahead and placed these 4x8 grow beds and have some garlic, onion, and potato starts. Going to go ahead and use flood irrigation on the exterior of these. Now we line the interior with a, a roofing material, an impermeable barrier, barrier we picked up at a garage sale for like a dollar. What that does is it keeps the wood from rotting. And we also painted the uh, inside of the wood to, to help last a little longer. We have some smaller ones, some two foot by four foot uh, frames as well as two foot by two foot frames. And the thought is there we could plant trees and some other things. We have the, um, the polyethylene uh, one inch line going to all of them and that will allow us to flood irrigate easily uh, and that way we can minimize the amount of energy we have uh, expended. This whole system is designed to be off grid and really carbon negative. To do that there's this 1.8 kilowatt system with a 400 amp hour AGM battery backup in a 5,000 kilowatt inverter, 5,000 watt. Yeah, I just wanted to point out one thing that, um, you know, the, the water floods via the one inch and one and a quarter inch lines, but I would recommend not using the cinder blocks. You're doing a better job of filling them. Around the perimeter wall, that grow bed utilizes these cinder blocks, which I pulled from a burnt out building for free. And the other um, grow beds utilized just soil cement in forms. And the forms I used were just 12 inch strips of OSB, uh, eight footers, uh, that I just kind of uh, screwed together, formed it up, and then poured the soil cement in. But the cinder blocks around the perimeter, um, they're not sealed very well, not nearly as well as the, the you know, mono pour, um, you know, other grow beds. And that results in water leaking out from under. I really like this just because it's cool to see the steam coming out in the winter time. It's pretty neat.